Hey there gang, time for another comic book unboxing video. We've got a box of books here that I need to pull out of this box so that I can grade them for sale on eBay and I have no idea what is in this box. I've been waiting for you to come along, sit down beside me so we can check them out together. So if you like comic books, stick around. We're going to have some fun. Hey there, Bob. Hey, welcome to Shanghala. My name is Duke, and this is an unboxing video. And this is a return of the mystery box, the true mystery box. We've spent several videos now working through uh, old inventory and returns and and other things, but this this is a return to greatness. The uh, the mystery box, things that have been culled from recent collections that we've purchased from all over the country, all over the world. Those books come into our warehouse in Freeport, Maine. They're divvied up into different sales streams and the things that we intend to sell on eBay as what we call raw singles. That's what ends up on my desk. I need to put a grade on them and I have no idea what is in this box, what the owner of the company has culled out of those other collections and uh, put into this box for me to work on. So this video is not to you know, sell you on anything, although certainly if you are interested in these books, you are welcome to follow us on eBay. The seller name is Dotcom Comics, and usually these books will end up on eBay within about a week or so of when you see the unboxing video or the grading video or something like that. But really this video is just a chance to look at some old comic books together and to chat about uh, different things, different aspects of the hobby, the history, the characters, the stories. And it's a dialogue. I invite you to sound off in the comments below because, you know, from time to time, and I, I know, knock you over with a feather, you, you won't believe this, but sometimes I say stupid stuff. <laughs> And you are welcome to smack me down and correct me in the comments below. Disagree with me. If I say, you know, this story sucked and I hated it, tell me why I'm wrong. Oftentimes, it's been 30 years since I read that. And maybe, maybe my perception uh, is colored by the, by the foggy mists of history, as it were. <laughs> or, you know, whatever bad mood I was in at the time I read it. 30 years ago. So uh, please do like, share, subscribe, comment, do all the groovy things. Don't forget that if you are a subscriber and leave a comment, once I hit 500 subscribers, I will be conducting a giveaway. Uh, I've got two Bronze Age mystery boxes, so there will be two drawings. You have two chances to uh, win with just one comment. So subscribe, comment, you're in the game. All right, well, let's not waste any time. Let us yoik and away and get right to it. I'll pull out the first stack of books here. I've got more Drew the Merciless looking over things to see how I do. And here's a book, Batman Adventures Mad Love. And it's not in super high grade. We can see that. I think this is maybe a little dusty too, frankly. <laughs> but... Uh, I think this is maybe the like second, third, fourth, pretty early on uh, appearance of Harley Quinn in the uh, DCU, in the comics. Of course, she was a creation of um, Bruce Timm and Paul Dini for the uh, Batman Adventures TV show. But uh, yeah, so there's, there's that. That's cool. Here's some old school uh, detective comics, Batman and Robin. Is that a Neil Adams cover? I think it might be. It's pretty cool. Anyway, here's Detective Comics Batman and Batgirl. Oh, that was issue 395. This is 396. Batman's been run over, and look at uh, the guy on the bike here. He's just making it rain. <laughs> here you go. Here you go, Bats. Uh, let's see. There's 404. Still Batman and Batgirl. And they weren't teaming up. Batgirl had a, a backup strip. Uh, and uh, in here and this is uh look at this featuring enemy ace so this is kind of like a a thing from the brave and the bold i presume that title was known for having stories that weren't exactly in continuity As a matter of fact in the old multiverse uh they created this this whole thing just called earth b <laughs> where all the stories could go that didn't really fit into normal continuity things like batman teaming up with uh, enemy ace uh, world war 2 um, well, I was going to say hero, but I guess from our perspective, more of an anti-hero, right? Uh, here's uh, Detective Comics 406 with the Weeping Angels. 
410. This this is the uh, comic that inspired that Kevin Smith movie, Tusk. <laughs> It's not. Uh, Kevin Smith probably doesn't even know this is uh, is a thing, but it's just funny. Every time I see this cover, I think of that movie. And if you haven't seen Tusk, um, it's okay. It's it's from back when Kevin Smith still thought he was an actual legitimate filmmaker. Uh, and I I I don't mean to disparage him by that and say that he's not. But it seems like lately he's given up himself. He's just sort of given himself over to this role of um, podcaster, internet host, weeping on demand shill. <laughs> for for uh, yeah, he's he's a good member of the Access Media these days. Uh, he's kind of turned into the anti Kevin Smith, frankly. But uh, no, it's it's a fun little movie. Uh, it's uh it's worth seeing. Here's Detective Comics 411, not really high grade. 422. Oh no. Batgirl's giving away her identity. Here's number 434 with the spook. 423. Batman with a gun. What? That's crazy. Batman 435. Looks like the spook again. And as a matter of fact, the spook strikes again. So there you go. 436. I don't know why, but I've seen this issue a lot lately. We've had copies of this issue in the last three or four boxes. But it's, you know, probably because it is a, it's a September issue, which means that it would have gone on sale, what, three months before? So that would have been, what, June, July, August, September? Yeah, so June. And back in the day, back in the newsstand era, 20 cents, this is uh, early, mid-70s, um, you, you didn't have pre-orders. You didn't know what your sales were before you went to press, like you do today in the uh, direct sales system. Back in the newsstand era, you were more speculative printing, and, and the companies would print a lot more in the summer with the idea that, you know, kids are out and about. They're going to be higher sales in the summer than in the winter, which which was, of course, true. And so there would be a, a great disparity between the press run of a, of a book, you know, a regular ongoing title uh, in the summer versus the winter months. And so you often find that the, uh, the summer issues are more plentiful in the back issue market simply because there are more of them. Uh, more of them were put out there. More of them were purchased. More of them survived. So almost invariably, if you are trying to put together a run of silver or Bronze Age books from some particular title and you're missing an issue here or there, odds are, I bet you, it's a, it's a book that went on sale sometime during the uh, you know, fall or winter, not a summer book. Here uh, is a return to the uh, old logo, the original logo. That's Detective Comics 437. Here's a 100-page super spectacular. Love these. And it's funny, you know, 50 cents, what is that uh, with inflation? But today an 80-page book costs 10 bucks. I love these, though, because it was a great way to, you know, these, these stories down here were all reprints, but it was a really a great way to catch up with, uh, well, not catch up, and a lot of times it was uh, my first introduction to a lot of these characters, especially when it was a story from the Golden Age. These look like they're all Silver Age stories. And the Manhunter, of course, is all new. That's Walt Simonson. Almost certainly. Here's Batman number 250. 252. There's the spook again. The spook was a thing for a hot minute, wasn't he? Here's Batman meets the shadow. DC had a shadow title ongoing at this time. So that was obviously meant to try and uh, churn up sales. There's another 100 page super spectacular. Number 254. This one has past Batman stories. Here's a, an early-ish issue of Coney and the Barbarian, number 23. Swords in the Night. Well, that's cool. Let's pull out the next stack. Let's see what we've got. Magnus Robot Fighter, number one. So these issues, um, and I, I am not super hip 
on my uh, on my valiant knowledge I didn't really buy these books when they first came out and uh, but a lot of these early issues you have to check and see if there's a coupon there were coupons in the early books that I, I think you could send away for an extra book or something like that so they're more valuable if the coupon is still there here's Swamp Thing number two from the original run that's a Bernie Wrightston cover Another Wrightston cover on number three. Number four. Number five. Nice little run here, and I like this logo. I've, it's always been my favorite Swamp Thing logo. Because it just kind of just really says Swamp Thing. I mean, yes, it says Swamp Thing, but it, it says Swamp Thing. Here he is fighting some kind of bird robot. Number six. Number seven, this is actually the first uh, issue that confirmed the Swamp Thing stories took place in the DCU. And at this time, you know, not everything that DC published was in the universe, so to speak. You know, the Swamp Thing could very well have been its own self-contained thing. You know, not everything was obligated to exist in the same world as Superman and Batman. But this this book right here did, in fact, confirm that... The Swamp Thing stories did take place in the DCU. Here's number eight. Number nine, that's like a classic cover. And I see a lot of people, you know, doing unboxing and things, and they'll they'll say this is number one. And I, I it just because it looks like a number one, I guess. That's got a very kind of introductory pose to it. But that's number nine. And it's right there. I mean, it's not hard to say. Spider-Man 2099, number one. We see a lot of these. I think this was a, a high print run book that not a lot of people wanted. House of Secrets. That looks like a Wrightston cover too, although it's probably not. That's number 107. Number 112. That's kind of cool. Well, not for him. <laughs> number... 111 with the uh, crazy dragon hands. That would actually be a good. Uh, that'd be a good book today. Going to be a good Grant Morrison book. Crazy dragon hands, man. <laughs> Number 106, Lady in a Nighty. Number 103. That is a Wrightston cover. You can see right there. That's uh, Abel on the cover. Archie meets the Punisher. Boom. What do you think of that? Most incongruous crossover ever. Batman The Long Halloween. And uh, there are uh, rumors and um, set leaks and things like that, which tell us that the new uh, The Batman movie that they're working on, which is starring, uh, what's his name there from the from the teenage emo angst vampire movies. Um, Bruce Pattinson. Yes, yes. Uh, that movie uh, is going to be based on the long Halloween. So these issues should be kind of taking off. And this is number one of that series. The Nam number 84. That's the last issue. A little lower print run on uh, the later issues of this series. So, you yeah, know, that might do well. The Ren and Stimpy Show, number one. Now, you always want to check these issues because there's about 12 variants. And this is uh, this is probably a first printing because it says, You idiot, you opened a bag, now the comic is worthless. Then there are ones where he says, You idiot, there's a second print, it's worthless. And there's, there's a third print, it's worthless. But in this case, it does look like this has been taken out of the bag. Probably doesn't have its little um, smell of vision uh, thing that went with it. It had like a little air freshener thing that was included in the bag, in the poly bag with this book. So, um, yeah, Ren is kind of right. This, I won't say it's worthless, but it's worth a lot less uh, without the bag and that original smell -o vision gimmick thing. And time for another stack. Another fat stack. Batman 231, the man who saw with his fingers. That's kind of creepy, isn't it? There's number 248. 
This is, I believe, a Michael William Kaluta cover. There it is right there. 246, Robin is dead. Robin would die many times before he would actually die. A lot of covers uh, tease the death of Robin. That was something we really saw coming. <laughs> 245, Angsty Batman. 244, The Demon Lives Again. No, I don't think that's a first Ra's al Ghul. I need to check that. I always, I always forget exactly. Here's 243, 242, 241, 241. and uh, what is this, 240, 237, this is the uh, famous story that takes place, let's show it to you, right here at the uh, Halloween Parade in Rutland, Vermont. There it is. There are our, uh, the protagonists of this story looking very, very hippie 70s. <laughs> but uh, the Halloween Parade in Rutland, Vermont was, uh, was an actual thing that went on for many years. And so it's featured in, in this story. With the, uh, with the Grim Reaper there. So that's just kind of cool. 235. Looks like that's Talia. We're on to Amazing Spider-Man. 166. Captain America and the Falcon. 187. Oh, neat. First issue special. This confuses a lot of people. I, again, I, I love watching unboxing videos. Not so much like mine where people are unboxing things they intend to sell, but unboxing things they just bought. And I've seen a lot of videos where somebody isn't aware of this title and they get it and they see, oh, first issue special. This is the first issue. Wait a second. First issue number eight? <laughs> and it's always fun just to see the look in their eyes as they try and process the eighth first issue. What the heck? Uh, and there's another first DC issue here, which this is strange because this is similar to uh, the the little bullet that DC ran on the Tarzan books. When they took over Tarzan from Gold Key, they uh, they put one of these first DC issue because it was like issue 242 or something like that. But this is actually the Warlord's first appearance by Mike Grell in first issue special, which was a series, only lasted 13 issues, but it was, a, 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 it was like a showcase style title. You know, it was a different, a different tryout thing every every issue. And so number eight featured the first appearance of the Warlord and why it says first DC issue as if this first appeared someplace else initially, who knows. But anyway, that graduated into its own title, a title that was, by all accounts, one of DC's better selling books for a long time. It, it survived the DC implosion, for sure, so it was at least in the top half. We, we know that. This is nice, very nice. Weird War Tales number one. This Weird War sells pretty well for us. Um, it's a book that kind of got overlooked at the time. You know, the, the superhero zombies bought their Supermans, their Batmans, put them right in the poly bags. And uh, these issues, these types of things, tended to get purchased more by the casual consumer. So they're much less plentiful today. And uh, they are less plentiful and higher grade today. And they are eagerly sought after by collectors who now have all their Superman and Batmans and want to go back and get some of this other cool, neat stuff. Weird War is a title that would really kind of work today. Um, I know Vertigo has done a couple of uh, miniseries, but I would think it would, it, it would go as an ongoing title. But anyway, that's number one. I've never, I've actually never seen and held number one in my hands before I've had other low issue numbers, but this is in pretty nice, decent shape. It's at least a seven. It's got a little arrival date written on it there, but yeah, that's uh, that that should do very well on the eBay. Here's a uh, Superman Flash race and World's Finest Comics number one ninety nine. Here's another one. This is uh, one ninety eight, I believe. So that's really kind of a two-part story. 
Wonder Woman. This is during her um, her Diana Rigg phase during <laughs> during the period when uh, she eschewed her superpowers. And uh, it's actually not a bad run of books, but it's uh, much maligned these days. This is Catwoman in a costume that she didn't wear for very long. But uh, it's a kind of a different costume there for Catwoman, who didn't really make a lot of Silver Age appearances. There, uh, there she is in her full regalia with the mask on. That's number 201. Da -da -da. And let's see what else we got. These next few books are all in some bags here. This is Metal Man number one. And you can see it doesn't have a number one on it. This is where they would try and fool the distributors and the retailers. Because back during this era, early 60s, it was hard to sell a number one book. It was considered something that was untried, untested. You know, a distributor didn't really want to carry it. Retailers didn't want to stock it because they had no idea if anyone would buy it. That's why, um, you know, publishers would fall all over themselves trying to keep a high issue number. They changed the title, but keep the uh, keep the issue numbering just so they'd have a high number on the book, which said to retailers, to distributors, and and to consumers, here's a book that survived the test of time. This you know this may be worth your money because it's been around for a while. Clearly, people like it. But this is number one, and uh, so in order to disguise the fact that it's a number one from, you know, people who maybe don't follow the industry that well and don't know what all the titles are, uh, they just left the number one off of there in hopes that they wouldn't go, hmm, I've never seen a Metal Men book before. They would just not see the number one and be like, okay, well, I guess that's a thing. We'll throw that out. <laughs> oh, wow, Phantom Stranger number one. That's cool. That is cool. Phantom Stranger had a, a short run in the 50s, like five or six issues, uh, and then came back here in the uh, late Silver Age. It had a fairly lengthy run. I think it was mostly a bi-monthly title, so it's, it's not a lot of issues, but it was around for a fairly long time. There's number one. That's going to do super good. Super good on the eBay. Huh. Superman number 53. It's a Canadian edition. I don't know how they know that. Oh, right here. Published in Canada. Duh. Incomplete. So it's missing some pages. It's kind of brown, too. But that's interesting. You don't see that every day, do you? I didn't even really show you his face, but there is some classic Wayne Boring Superman. Here is uh, X-Men 221, first appearance of Mr. Sinister. And here is the classic cover. It's a classic cover that I don't really like that much. I mean, it's all right, but, you know, I, I, to me, the idea is better than the execution. But anyway, that's a super popular Todd McFarlane cover. And this is a newsstand edition, so that should bring a little bit of a premium. Got a fifteen dollar tag on the uh, on the bag there, but I think that's probably going to go for much more than that. <laughs> you watch and see if I'm not right. All right, well we're going to cut it off there, uh, just you know to keep the video kind of reasonable length, and so we will pick up with this box tomorrow. We're about halfway through the box right now. Please come back again tomorrow morning. We'll pick up right where we left off, and until then, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other.